to this uh, conference celebrating um, uh, Bob Mnookin's, uh, I think described as pathbreaking, seminal, uh, uh, and other wonderful, wonderful uh, adjectives. 1975 article, child custody adjudication. Uh, Could you hold one second? Is there, uh, yes. They want to take this. And it's not oh. <laughs> so we're not just hold that thought. <laughs> oh, I you okay. <laughs> Which part? Path breaking or? <laughs> Should I start? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? You want this prop? Okay, so I, th I think that, that, that this article, uh, Child Custody Adjudication, I actually have a hard time remembering the title. Uh, hi, Max. <laughs> hi. Uh, I'm, I'm, give I'm giving uh, uh, the, an introduction. Uh, <laughs> Sort of, more on tape. Uh, child custody adjudication, judicial functions in the face of indeterminacy. I'm pretty sure that this was the first family law article that I, that I ever read. And since, since that time, I have, uh, I have had a, uh, a tattered copy of it in a file uh, to consult as needed. Uh, unfortunately, given my, given my rather haphazard filing system, when I actually needed to consult it, I've just had to copy it again. And I had this sort of morbid thought yesterday that if I, if I drop dead and someone is cleaning out my office, they're going to wonder why I have 10 copies of this, <laughs> of this one law review article. Uh, but I probably, I probably do somewhere, somewhere uh, in, uh, in uh, my possession. Uh, it's, it's really uh, pretty hard to overstate how important this article has been to family law scholarship and law and, uh, and practice. And I think it's sort of a testament to the impact of a scholar's work that, that insights become conventional wisdom. And that's pretty much what has happened with, uh, with a lot of Bob's work. Uh, Bargaining in the shadow of the law is a, a pretty good example, but it is certainly true also with uh, with uh, this article. Uh, Bob was not the first scholar to note the indeterminacy of the best interest standard. I would sort of give Lon Fuller credit for uh, credit uh, uh, for that, but he explained uh, in, in it's, it, with wonderful clarity how the, uh, the best interest standard often rests on values about which there is no consensus and on complex predictions that we simply don't have the, uh, have the uh, uh, knowledge uh, uh, to make. The article also explained uh, that the differences in the judicial function in different kinds of uh, of uh, custody disputes, and uh, and and this, the different stakes in uh, in private disputes and uh, in uh, what what he calls uh, child protection cases, in which the state intervenes in uh, in uh, the family. And so Kate and I thought it would be uh, be exciting to bring together leading family law scholars and uh, and researchers. Uh, to uh, who had worked in this field, who had written about about custody, to reflect on uh, on developments in uh, in the law and in practice in the not quite 40 years since uh, since uh, this article uh, was written, and I, I think it's fair to say we're pretty much blown away by the results. Uh, the the articles are amazingly varied. And in different ways, each one of them sort of engages with with Bob's uh, uh, Bob's analysis in in really really pretty pretty uh, interesting uh, interesting ways. So we couldn't we couldn't be more pleased about uh, about the group of articles that that uh, that you all have have written. I think it's it's really 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 pretty exciting. I mean, just I mean, we'll talk about each of them, and I'm certainly not going to to say much about them, but I think the variety is really interesting and the different dimensions of 
the uh, of Bob's article that uh, that each one engages is is uh, is exciting. So 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 Emily views constitutional parental rights as a kind of an antidote to the indeterminacy of the, of the best interest uh, standard. And Claire's article uh, looks at the regulation of child uh, of the child welfare system and how it has and hasn't absorb the lesson of uh, uh, lessons that Bob offered uh, in uh, in his article. Uh, Nancy looks at at um, custody disputes uh, between lesbian partners and in the the way the meaning of natural parent, which we thought was was straightforward in 1975, has changed uh, pretty dramatically uh, uh, since that time. Bruce's article uh, reports on research uh, from Australia, uh, which has undergone a very comprehensive uh, uh, law reform in, uh, in putting in place uh, uh, a, a system that favors joint custody and the lessons that, uh, that those reforms may have for, uh, for other countries, including, including uh, the US. And, and Jana and Bob both, both look at, uh, at process. Bob wants to, wants to get rid of, of legal dispute resolution altogether. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Jana looks at the, at, the, at the relationship between the substantive law and, uh, and uh, the process of, of resolving uh, custody uh, disputes. And Kate and I uh, both, both uh, look at the way in which the best interest standard has has or hasn't reformed over the past uh, past 40 years in the resolution pri of private uh, private disputes. So it's 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 such an interesting and diverse range of papers that uh, that I I am really incredibly excited about uh, about uh, the day. And I welcome you all here. I think this is going to be really really very very exciting. So okay. Let me just add a few logistical, very miscellaneous logistical things. So first of all, welcome to my home. Uh, this is, uh, love to have you all, I'm really glad to have you all here and, and echo what Buffy said about the, the wonderful quality of these papers. Glad each and every one of you who's participating could actually come to the symposium as well as write the papers. Bob, I meant to toast, have a long elaborate toast to you last night, but I'm going <laughs> to save that for lunch. Uh, I forgot. Um, we will be in this room all day. Um, you should feel free to get up and move around. You might decide you, there's a better seat for, for you to engage in the group. You can change your seat and go out and get coffee. There will be some food or another on that table all day long. They'll bring in some bag lunches at noon, and we'll just go, to, go right through lunch uh, with Bob's remarks. Um, I think the dean is going to stop by for a minute. I'm not sure about that. Um, that is Gladys Bethea out there. Uh, so if you need to discuss with her cab arrangements, uh, any other needs that you don't have met right now, other than paying your bills, uh, that, uh, that she can help you with, uh, Gladys will be there all day. Um, so you can see you all have one of those cards, uh, Dale and Jana, we can get you ones. Um, and, and to jump way ahead, um, the papers are due on uh, June, Buffy help me out, 13th, 15th, 15th. June 15th, yeah. so you should submit uh, those papers to me and Buffy by June 15th, if at all possible, that will keep us on a good schedule. Questions or any other introductory matters that we should take care of? So uh, Emily, let's see, let's have the speaker, um, unless you make other arrangements between yourselves, the speaker here and the uh, commenter maybe can sit here or there and then switch places uh, when the time comes. I'm going to pass around the original of this, just so people can, there are only about three of us old enough to actually be professionally active when this came out, but um, it's kind of fun. All right, great. Um, I don't know if I need, am I in, engaged with this microphone in a way that's yeah, okay. useful for taping? All right, great. Uh, well, thanks so much. I was thanks, Kate, um, and uh, and and Buffy for for pulling this together and and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, the 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 design is really brilliant. I mean, I love the idea of are all in some way engaging 
an article, not, not, to, not even better this article, but just an article, and, and therefore all, as you say, sort of building in different directions, but having a, you know, a lot to say to one another as well. And, and so my understanding is the design of this day is to maximize the conversation and minimize the talking at, and that we're 10 minutes is what I was told, and I might even come in under in the spirit of being the sort of leading off and trying to set a good trend. Of course, I say that, and then I always lose complete track of what time it is, so we'll see if that's actually uh, true. Um, so, and one of the great things about this whole uh, occasion is we had a chance to sit down and read again an article that we all think we remember enough or we have our copies we can pull out when we want it for a footnote or we want to refer it to a, to a colleague or, or, or a friend. But sitting down and reading it sort of from front uh, to end is, uh, was, was just a, fan, a fantastic experience. And what I have to say, a couple things for me came out most, most starkly. Uh, one is... You, you said so much, you, so, so Bob, and for the, for the record, I am pointing to Bob Mnookin um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and saying both in terms of the sort of the organization of the world, the understanding, the description, uh, the capturing of the problems, and the <coughs> seeing into the future, uh, the prescience of the article is really just remarkable. A little alarming, I might say. Uh, some things that I thought were very original when I said them. I realized you had actually already said them in some form, and that's a little disturbing, but uh, but but uh, but it makes the article you know just it's just such an impressive piece. Um, so it was great to to discover that. And the other thing that I discovered, which sort of inspired uh, what is sort of the the kernel of an article that will be, uh, is uh, the the lack of discussion of parental rights. Um, and to a large extent, that was because they had not yet developed, and so sort of my, my interest in seeing how they developed and thinking about how what developed in the context of parental rights uh, fits, and I think fits remarkably tightly with uh, Bob's prescriptions, uh, but also in sort of an interesting little side piece is, well, there, was, there were some important cases that had just been decided, and uh, they're, they're not there. So that, that was a sort of an interesting uh, sort of thing, thing to know, sort of historically intriguing uh, to me. <laughs> but what, what I was most struck by in sort of looking at the progress, and there was a real explosion of parental rights cases that ca followed uh, the article quite quickly. So the next decade was, was you know, many, many uh, sort of important parental rights cases, both in the context of that protective services, the sort of the public custody realm, and in the context of the, of the, the private custody uh, uh, realm as well. So sort of tracking, tracking that sort of a distinction that, that Bob effectively drew and sort of explored the implications of uh, that, that came, uh, followed the article. And what I was particularly struck by in thinking about the development of that law is how, how much I thought it faithfully adhered to Bob's prescriptions, which I'm not going to sort of work through and you're all all familiar with. Uh, you know, this was very gratifying uh, for me to read because uh, sort of I and others, Buffy among them, have, have you know, for some time taken the position that parental rights have developed in a way that is child serving and, and you know, sort of Part of part of the view, my view certainly, is that they 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 would not have they could not be uh, continue to be justified today if they were not child serving, um, and you know I started to wonder in, in in thinking about that coincidence about whether there was some sort of way that sort of almost sort of organically kind of had to be that the sort of the pressure the understanding of 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 the importance of those rights serving children's interests was sort of you know maybe sort of embedded in some kind of a way that was uh, worth exploring more. Um, so I, I don't want to rehearse my, you know, the, the, what, is, what is set out in, in writing is, is very clear for those of you who had a chance to read it, even though it came in the last minute, there's, there's a lot still to be done, some typos to be corrected, among other things, but more importantly, some uh, so thinking to de be developed. So I thought it would be more interesting and useful for our conversation to, to sort of try to flag some of the things that I want to uh, continue to think about and, and explore. Um, so one is that I've sort of begun to discover that it is not just a kind of happy coincidence or sort of meaningful coincidence that these uh, parental rights cases seem to track a lot of the prescriptions. In fact, some of those cases cite to the article, to, to Bob's article, and even those that don't, in some sense, cite to some idea or some other source that it, you can track back to the article. A lot of things can be traced through Marty Guggenheim. Um, it's very sort of, in, I, I, I'm really looking forward to doing more of that sort of, of that exploration to see the extent to which, in fact, the article itself drove 
some of the some of the analysis important in important ways. So another another influence that I didn't expect to uh, to find, but I think probably a significant influence of the article. So that's one one direction I want to want to go um, in moving forward. Another is to pick out sort of some of the particular ideas that that are identified and discussed in some of your papers, and to think about the implications, uh, potential implications uh, for constitutional analysis in the in, in the context of parental rights. I want to sort of flag the, the the joint custody. Sort of looking over here, this is a you know this this part of the the, the room in one way or another has acknowledged the the, the development of uh, the sort of the the, the argument for uh, joint custody and particularly the connection between that argument and fa the fathers' rights movement. It's very much an equality movement. Um, and you know one way of putting this is if we were just sort of starting with the constitutional doctrine. And, and you know, sort of you know, set the, the Manukan ideas and child welfare to one side, um, and just thinking about uh, constitutional doctrine, we might ex expect that by today there would be a constitutional ruling saying that joint custody was constitutionally required, right? We have sort of a commitment to equality, sort of, and, and um, is, that the, is that the implication that would follow from a case like Caban? Well, I think if we were sort of abstracted and just thought about uh, sort of parental rights as sort of the, the, the foe of a proper consideration of children, of child welfare, we might expect that kind of a case. So one thing I would just like to get, um, and I think the fact that we don't have any such case really reflects the fact that there, uh, there is a real sort of appropriate resistance in the development of that doctrine uh, that is a resistance that is tied to understandings of what is just, you know, we can go all the way back to Solomon, right? It just doesn't, uh, it isn't necessarily a good idea to go 50-50 um, if, you're, if you're looking at this from the perspective of children. So I'd like to spend some time looking at the litigation side of the picture that, that, um, that Buffy and Bob discussed in some detail on the sort of legislative side um, uh, 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 to get a sense of to what extent has that even been pushed and, and, what, and, and, and does that analysis shed another light on this sort of connection between how we think about parental rights and uh, our commitment to child well-being. Another thing I'd like to chase down is what I see as a kind of the real risk, a constant risk of slippage. I mean, the one thing that, Buffy, you said in your remarks is that sort of insights that have become conventional wisdom. Uh, I agree with that and as a general principle, but I, I think this is, uh, the, 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 in, the, the, the core insight of this article is actually uh, resists understanding in conventional wisdom, which is the idea that having a set of a structure in law that serves children's interest is, you know, one thing. Putting on judges the responsibility for making best interest determinations in individual cases is another thing. And the I, the way to get to child welfare is often not, indeed, is sometimes very much thwarted by placing uh, that uh, that assessment at the individual judge level. And I think that is. I, I, conventional wisdom may be among people in this room, but that doesn't really count as conventional <laughs> wisdom. I want to say, um, I wanted to. I, I, I think that there is that there is a, a real danger. There's always a sense that when you care about children, what do you do? You make sure judges are asking, you know, what's in child's best interest, and that you know, Bob warned us of the dangers and the and the limitations that come with that approach. And I, I pointed in in um, in the draft to Justice Stevens' opinion in Troxel, which I you know I. Uh, I think is very scary, and I think it's very scary precisely because it misses this idea so deeply, so profoundly, sort of celebrates best interest analysis and, you know, and adjudication and cites to all the, the various laws that engage in this kind of an analysis and completely elides uh, the, the distinction between laws that are designed to serve children and this inquiry that should be happening or not at, at the level of the, uh, the individual adju adjudications. And the fact that that opinion has really been quite celebrated among uh, child advocates, I think, is a sort of a, is, is, is a real red flag that we, we need to always, you know, reread the article and remember, uh, remember that danger. Um, uh, so I sort of want to want to look at this. I want to spend some more time looking at sort of contemporary discussions that are framed in in child advocacy terms and see to what extent the the the, the vision has been lost in a lot of that in a lot of that discussion. Um, and the last thing, and this is related to that Justice Stevens' opinion, is I want to uh, take up the question of children's rights and thinking about uh, children's constitutional rights, right, and thinking about the extent to which I'm generally sort of quite, quite um, uh, open to the idea, sort of very receptive to the idea of recognizing constitutional rights in children. Um, but particularly, I think this context raises, raises a really interesting problem, um, which is to what extent can we recognize independent rights of children in this 
in this particular context, it would be associational rights. Sort of that's one path to validating the idea of the psychological parent. Um, is sort of, you know, where are those relationships? So we maybe should ground the right in the child rather than the parent if we're really defining, you know, how, how we understand what matters in that relationship. But the worry, of course, is that you can't expand the number of constitutional claimants without being in exactly the same problem you're in, you were in in 1975 in those private adjudications, which is are we just asking essentially to shift to the, maybe the federal adjudication, uh, sort of a, 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 the challenge of how, you know, how we allocate among and how we think about that and what drives that uh, decision making, right? The worry is that if you multiply parties, you inevitably require some kind of an individualized assessment and we've been very effectively warned that that is a potentially, a potentially dangerous direction to go. So I think that's roughly 10 minutes. Um, I really look forward to hearing from you all. First, first from Maxine, and so I'll sit down so you can stand up. Is I, that, I gotta is that good? Yeah, okay. I have to say, I like, I'm appreciating why King said this is like. <laughs> <laughs> I will bow down. <laughs> I'll surrender the seat. Hi, everybody. I'm probably know most of you, but I'm Max Eichner. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Buffy and Kate, for I guess, bookending the room, for, for, for inviting me um, and for putting a symposium on, on, on such a great subject. I also um, I had loved going back and, and reading Professor Manukin's paper, um, and it was, it was wonderful to see you engage Emily with him. Um, um, and and I mean, it seemed to me that, that you're, you're paper really captured the spirit of this article in terms of let, let's kind of cut through the bullshit doctrine and, and, and think about how, how this works on the ground. Um, um, and, and I wish I'd written what you'd written and I agree with most of it in the spirit of, of um, engaging and, and thinking hard about these issues. Um, I, 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 wanted to, to push you and, and think through um, a couple of ways in which I am a little less confident than you are that the strong doctrine of parental constitutional rights that the Supreme Court has been developing actually does operate to, in, in the best interest of kids. So, so let, let, let me point out just those couple of concerns. Um, and, and following the framework of your paper, the first of those concerns comes up in the child protection context when it's a, 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 a contest between parents and the state. Um, you know, as the Supreme Court has constructed that right, it's framed in terms of, of somebody wins, the parent or the state, and if the parent wins, then the state's got to stay up. Um, um, and, 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 unless, and, and the way the doctrine is, is constructed, the state has to stay out unless the parent is proven unfit. The court doesn't evaluate best interests of the child. Um, boy, I don't, I don't want to sound too much like a communitarian of the 90s. <laughs> um, but, I mean, let, let, let's, you know, first let's recognize this, this peculiar framing of this constitutional doctrine. It's, you know, it, it is the state or the family um, the state or the parents, and, and you know, who, whoever wins, wins this right to exclude the other party. Um, if the parent wins, the state has to stay out. And, uh, you know, let, let's recognize that what this means, and the way the Supreme Court frames this doctrine is, if the parent wins, you know, in many respects, respects the child has, has already lost. Um, you know, the, the child may not lose as badly as if the state wins, but the children who are, are at risk of, of foster care badly need some support and their families badly need some support in at least a number of cases. You know, these are all, or, or, or you know, most of these kids are in inadequate housing, um, they lack uh, adequate medical care, they, uh, 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 they come with a, a range of, of mental health and physical health problems that haven't been treated because their parents can't afford to treat them. Um, and, and framing this is, is uh, the state needs to stay out rather than the, the state and the family together have, have some responsibility to support this child, you know, it, it is, is a much less productive framing than if we were going to start from scratch. We, 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 the way we might frame it. 
um, it's interesting to me, Emily, and you, you may recognize this, your, your, your draft skirts that problem. And you skirt that problem by, by incorporating, in addition to the parental constitutional rights doctrine, the, the uh, provision from the 1980 Child Welfare Act that says that judges have to make reasonable efforts to keep kids in their family. I mean, that was, that was interesting. It doesn't come from the constitutional doctrine. I mean, it, I think it was your way of, of subtly, you know, and, and maybe un, uh, unconsciously incorporating that, that which, which, which has to be there. So, 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 I mean, let me point out though, that, that, you know, that doesn't come from the constitutional doctrine. You know, that comes from a, a, a more productive framing that might be in kids' interests. Um, okay, so that was, that was the, uh, the, the, the concern in the child protection context in the, in the, pri in the context of, of private custody adjudication, adjudications. We, there, you know, Professor Manukin wrote this article almost 40 years ago when, when an all or nothing framing of parents' rights the way the Supreme Court does it, uh, you know, it, it seems to me would, would uh, have been far less questioned. Um, you know, it, 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 you know that was, boy, that was you know before the the increasing visibility of same-sex parents, you know, of 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 uh, assisted reproductive technology, where where you know we could come up with you know three folks who had the right to, to contenders as parents, or or four folks to the right of contenders as parents. Um, you know, in the burning question, and that you know, way back then was, well, what happens when two parents, you know, two two people who are clearly the parents aren't married, and how should the court respond to that? You know, that is that is so not the framework now. Um, and you, you know, I I think again, maybe consciously, or I, I think this one is consciously. You 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 raise one of the 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 questions that these changes might um, might. Uh, that the, 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 these uh, changes in, in families raise, which is, I mean, you point out, well, the fact that it is, there is no genetic tie doesn't mean that person, that somebody can't be a parent. And, you know, certainly that is one of the, the, the uh, questions that our brave new families raise when it comes to this doctrine of, of strong parental constitutional rights. But it seems to me that there is another question there that raises that, that is even more stark and more basic, which is why, you know, the, the, the way the court constructs the right, um, you, uh, if, if you are dubbed a parent, whether by genetics or uh, uh, a psychological parent, you get the whole bag of rocks, this whole bundle of rights that come with parenting. Um, if you're not dubbed a parent, Kiss. Um, you know, and, and you know, are there more productive ways these days um, to to uh, to frame what's in kids' interests? You know, without you know going back to square one of having the court determine the best interests of the child, they don't so completely say, parent, you get it all; non-parent, you get nothing. Um, you know, in the context of, of, of Troxel even, I'm much, you know, I, I'm much more troubled than you are by the results in that case. It does seem to me, you know, if these are, and, and, and I don't know from the record, but if these are grandparents who truly have a tie um, with the child, there might be intermediate rules of adjudicating these kinds of cases that, that um, truly protect the child's interest better than a doctrine that says, in every case, whoever is dubbed a parent gets to uh, uh, make these determinations absolutely and exclusively. Okay, I will leave it there, but, but I look forward to the conversation. So I think Are you supposed to respond? Should, that Emily should, okay. should yeah, okay. respond to Max before we open it up. And then control the questions, too. Control the questions, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> who, who agrees with me? No. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, great. Thanks so much, Max. I, um, I, I those are all really, uh, I think, very helpful uh, 
press prods, and um, I have some responses to some, and some I, I guess I want to keep mulling. It's fun when the context of the day is where my response is to your first point, Claire, to your second point, Nancy, and you know, like, I mean, it's really wonderful. So um, I, I, um, I could not so to take one at a time. The child protection, I could not agree with you more that there, that, I mean, I, I'm not an, I'm not, I'm I'm not afraid of so the, the, the S word socially. I mean, I, I very much agree that we should be doing much more to support families as families. I, I, don't, I don't see that so much in conflict. I think there are we, ways we help family while recognizing and, you know, sort of recognizing the family, and that doesn't mean we don't help them. But I mean, I, but I, um, and I completely share the view that, that Claire, I think, is very effective at um, arguing, which is that sort of if we really want to change and sort of improve upon our child welfare system, we need to be doing much more by way of prevention and really providing that support. So I, I agree with that as a, as, as a matter of policy. In terms of the, the analysis of how that fits in with a constitutional doctrine, it's certainly true that the reasonable efforts requirement, that structure did not come from, you know, the sort of court saying you have to do it. But um, I, I think, in fact, they could, it could have, and it's very consistent sort of right, with, the, uh, with the constitutional analysis. And as a matter of fact, in some states, they essentially have done this. Sort of, they've found their way to a, uh, a, a standard, sort of an, a reasonable efforts type standard, but an even higher sort of threshold. And they've done it through the, the parental rights cases. And in the context of analyzing those cases, they've said, you know, this is in the child's interest as well. So I don't think, I don't see that as a, as a dichotomous world, but it's interesting to think more about the extent to which uh, the fact that it developed outside any kind of constitutional mandate is relevant for thinking through those issues. The private context, I mean, some of you know, I've, I've, I have taken on this subject, and I, I am a believer in the whole, the whole bag of rocks, and the bundle of sticks, whatever. Um, I, I think that Nancy's insight, or the sort of the, the history that she tells in such effective detail, um, I, I, we, we talked about this a little bit on the way over. I, I, I felt was somewhat vindicating, sort of my view, that the, that the world needs to keep recreating itself in terms of its understanding of who we call a parent but that, that it should still be that inquiry rather than the sort of the multiplicity. Why? I guess I, you know, a couple of things I'll just say very quickly. One is, you know, what, what Bob has identified, which is if you, if you don't do it that way, you have to have someone pretty heavily engaged who is not the family itself, right, saying what, which is good and which is bad and which are the most important. And, and, and that's, I think it's hard to, to solve the puzzle without doing that. If you can solve the puzzle without doing that, I might be more uh, receptive to the idea of, the, of recognizing. But the other thing is just that we, we function as these family units, and the idea that we say, you know, you're the parents, uh, but even though you think it's a really bad idea to have contact, or that amount of contact, the Troxel case, she was allowing visits, she just didn't want as much as they wanted, um, that we think that we're gonna have an effective system when we have Bob, bowing to Bob now, the, 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 the idea of court-mandated interrelationships against the interests of the people we've defined and given authority to as parents. So better world to, you know, to have that level of receptivity to all the people who matter in kids' lives, absolutely. You know, does a structural matter? Do we want to set things up so that those individuals have the opportunity to press against, for good or bad reasons, parents' views of what is going to work? I think we slip back into the world, or right? we'd be concerned about that. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll stop there because I really want to be a good role model at not talking too much. Nancy. Uh, so you talk about Stevens and Troxel, and I think as you're working through the paper, I would suggest you read him and Michael H. Also, oh, yeah. because you know that's the fifth vote in Michael H. and. It's proof that the Supreme Court doesn't understand family law, if we, need, that. If we needed any proof. <laughs> right. But yeah. there's Stevens saying, this guy got a hearing, and the judge decided it wasn't in the child's best interest to let him have visitation rights, and that's good enough for me. And, you know, a family law person reads it and says, okay, if he's a parent, he doesn't get his visitation curtailed on best interest grounds. So what do you mean in saying, well, he got all he was entitled to and that he got some kind of best interest determination and so that's good enough? And uh, I think the extent to which the Supreme Court doesn't understand family law is a, a real problem. I mean, they're the Supreme Court. They make these decisions that then all the judges and all the states have to deal with. 
Uh, anyway, I just thought yeah, that so, was reasonable. So, so real quickly on that, I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I need to do in the papers is work through those cases that I just sort of nod and say, here's what they say, you know, all this. Michael H. is the opposite, one has the opposite experience reading Michael H. that one has reading Bob Manukin's article. Every time you read that case, if you read it in full, <laughs> it drives you crazy, right? You think, procedural due process, substantive due process, what are we talking, who's the parent, what's like, it's, it's, it's confusing in a way that I think if you, sort of, I completely agree with you, working through is valuable not only because it captures what they don't understand, but it really gets into this idea of where, where is this about who's a parent or is it, right, what follows, but it's, it's, I absolutely agree that it's something that I, I will need to uh, work through with some attention. It won't be fun. Well, it'll be kind of fun in that agonizing way. Yeah, Claire. Um, so Emily, I'm you, you said something that was quite intriguing that, I, I'm, I, that I, I just want to hear you expand on a bit more in response to Max about this idea that the state, that, that the reasonable effort standard that the state that we have in the 1980 Act might actually have some constitutional basis. And I wonder if you could just say more about that. Are you saying that some states have said, because, you know, this whole thing, I mean, Max has obviously written about this, this idea that there is no obligation on behalf of the state to actually help families. But I guess I wonder if you were saying that in fact there is or that states have in some ways recognized that or perhaps maybe it's only recognized at the very late stage. But is that is that true that we've recognized this at the moment that your child's going to be taken away? Maybe the state has some constitutional requirement? Could we roll that back and say earlier they have some constitutional requirement? So, yeah, yeah, so, so, so very interesting. So, so first of all, you know, the more it's cast as this affirmative right to have services, the more problematic it yeah. is, you know, see, DeShaney, et cetera. Um, but the more, but, but, but yes, there's some state case. I'm thinking, the one I'm thinking of right now, don't have in front of me to check to make sure I'm remembering it right, is in Ray Juvenile Appeal, which is a Connecticut case. But were cases where the court has said, um, you know, beca because family has a right to stay together, <laughs> um, and this is that's described in that case as both the right of the parent to, you know, care, control, uh, companionship, and for the child, it's the right of this ongoing sort of associational interest with a kind of developmental feel to that idea. Um, there, the state can only remove where absolutely necessary. I mean, it's a sort of Manukin type uh, prescribed standard. Um, and that the idea of how you think about what's absolutely necessary, I think um, in that case, there was an, they, the state did enough things wrong that they didn't have to really dig in deep. But I think a lot of the things that are said in that opinion, the idea of how do we think about what's necessary, well, if there's something that could have been done, um, I think, you know, that arguably is, is, a, is a piece of, of, of the, the necessity determination. And you can come up with the most extreme cases, right, you can, you can say, well, it's, it's obvious if, you, you know, if, they, if, they, if they're arguing that they, um, you know, kids all have to be removed because there's no lock on the door, you know, it's ridiculous. Well, obviously, they could have done, I mean, I think, it's, I think you can imagine a path of cases that would basically essentially be identifying something that looks like um, requiring something affirmative of the state in, in that necessity determination. I follow up on, a, on Nancy's last point, which is, I think, uh, one of the insidious things about the comment about the Supreme Court not understanding. Um, one of the things that has to be going on here is that um, in the family law area, everybody thinks they know what they know. <laughs> and so you can't imagine the justices going back and doing heavy duty research on children or parents or. Uh, even Bob and Newkin's article. Uh, it just, they, they know what they know, and, uh, and so um, it is, we're, we're working on instincts, which is what the best interest is all about. But, um, so I, I, I'm not sure, Bob, that you directly addressed that in your article, although certainly implied as one of the, one of the things that makes this so dangerous. Um, Everybody's the expert. Yeah, I, I find this frustrating as a as a family law scholar. It's like you know when I when we have faculty workshops, everybody's <laughs> like everybody knows I'm a parent. It's like, you know, Richard Epstein knows everything about it. You know, it's like okay, fine, you're, you're a parent. The next one. Um, and and there's you know there's something to that. Maybe, but 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 there's a real limit how much there's to it. I mean, like like I the say, judge, like the trial the, judge in Troxel. Well, judge I had such a good days. time with my grandparents I, when I, I was a child. Experience. Exactly, yeah. it was such a good thing. Exactly. Um, and no, I, I think the only thing I can say about that is, is whether it's because they don't like the cases or whether be, they, they realize that they really are not very sort of deeply um, sort of, uh, uh, involved in the law, they don't, they, they don't grant cert in very many of these cases. And maybe, maybe we should think that's a, a good thing, right? There are other areas where they take cert a lot and they also have no competence like civil procedure and evidence, don't get me started, where I just like, you know, they, think, you know, they, they take cases all the time and they really muck things up. They so they have a yeah. significant number of unwed father cases. So, they so had much, a very so systematic, much right, yeah. court family law right. is, is on the backs of unwed Yeah, well, and I think those cases, that's really interesting. They clearly at one point looked like they had a project. They were going to get together, <laughs> take the cases and they were going to work 
broke it out, and you thought you knew where they were going, and then Michael H. kind of blew the, the top off things. And, and, and um, what you, you know, what I was really struck, I recently uh, was, was teaching these cases in class, is that really most of what you get from those cases is, is you know, a lack of constitutional protection, there, right? There's Danley, uh, which, which I think is a sort of captures the core uh, that there is a constitutional protection that is tied to some combination of the genetic connection and uh, psychological parenthood. It doesn't say that's the whole universe, but that's at least within the universe. Uh, but then lots of circumstances where uh, the finding is not that somebody else has a constitutional right, but just that there's this particular person who has that package doesn't have the constitutional right, which is interesting. So I kind of think of them almost sort of ending in despair <laughs> at the end. I mean, I actually, you know, I'm more happy with the, with the result of that line of cases than a lot of people are. Uh, but, but, but in the end, the conclusion was not, look, you know, it was robust protection of a, you know, huge category that sort of, uh, that, that clearly defines who a parent is, but rather a message that there's a lot of room for states to work out what they, who they want to call parents, which I think uh, Nancy has sort of suggested they, some of them at least, have used productively. Of course, others have used very unproductively, which is, might be a reason to be concerned. Bob? Any thoughts about the uh, recent Indian yeah. adoption case? <sighs> Sigh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I've thought about how much that sort of that that line should be. It's probably so another thing I should mention should should add to the to the to the list. Um, I'm so I'm I'm sighing so much rather than answering you because I, I find that particular category of cases very very uh, difficult. Meaning I I keep changing my mind about what I even sort of think about them. I mean, sort of the whole idea of the Indian Child Welfare Act brought in this idea that communities as communities sort of have standing and are sort of are, are recognized, but sort of within, and then of course the complexity of the tribunals. So I guess what I'd say is, I, I feel like I'm still mulling. It's clearly relevant in thinking through these issues, uh, but I think it's, it's very difficult and it's hard to know how much the decision making in that context is just inevitably idiosyncratic in a way that, you know, but uh, it's like, it's not a very another, satisfying answer. Another dimension of that case in a way is that you know, at its core, it's a private dispute between claimants of who, with whom the child's going to live. <laughs> Given the delays in the litigation process, right. because apparently now the child's been with the yeah. father for right. three years. Right. No, no, since December of 2011. Oh, so it's only so a year and now. fifteen right. a, a fifteen months. Okay. And right. yeah. And, and how many, How long? 27 months. With, with the other, but right. anyway, the, the other thing that's so anguishing about right. these cases is the litigation process as it drags out, you know, in some ways what you might characterize as a private dispute. There becomes real a, a, well, that an is issue of a real detriment to the child. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I would, I mean, I would add that to the list of the reasons you try to keep these things out of court as much as you can. I mean, actually, it's striking in Palmori, too. You look back and how long that he... He, she, I was he, she was, right, she, child was she, I believe, um, was, had been with the father before it got to the, the Supreme Court. It's like, oh, whatever else is going on, this is a case where this child's going to be moved again. Um, but she wasn't. She did, yes, yeah, so, so. No, she, she wasn't. She, she wasn't. stayed with her father. She stayed, okay. It's so just shocking. My students are always shocked yeah. about this, that, you know, you win in the Supreme Court and oh, you don't get right, your kid back. Right, right. Yeah, she so, never got her, she never got her back. And why? What because happened? the Florida court deferred to the Texas court where the father had moved with his new wife and Melanie, and the Texas court said it was, you know, in the child's best interest to... For these reasons, not to move. It's not about race that. anymore. It's about right. staying exactly. with each other. Yeah. Exactly. So she never got her right. back. Mm -hmm. So, Emily, I thought that the conversation between you and Max put your finger on the what I find is the, one of the most puzzling and challenging dilemmas um, kind of think these things through, and that is, is it possible to create a system that at the front end recognizes, respects, you know, the diversity of, of, of the ways that people construct their families, and yet at the back end avoids precisely, you know, the problems that you and Bob and, you know, so many people have, have identified with, you know, with adjudicating on a, you know, a, some kind of balancing or best interest standard. Um, what do you think about that? And I guess one possibility I'm channeling my colleague um, Martha Ertman, you know, is to uh, talk about contract as, you know, one mechanism for kind of mediating between those two points in time 
just wondered if you had any thoughts, and Max also about that, or about other, you know, other ways of trying to do both things with the legal system. Yeah. Do, I mean, one thought I have again, sort of referring to something that Nancy and I discussed a bit on the way over here, is that I think to some extent, you know, back end ex post pain is a necessary sort of, you know, sort of it's kind of a growing pain to get to better sort of ex ante design and that you know what I would say is that there's it doesn't wash away every complexity to say this but that sort of clear rules about sort of ident parent identification at the front end um, is is the way to go and that might be through contract it might be through states recognizing some array of people it might be through some registration system uh, sort of sensible defaults that people could sort of define away from um, and that even though in the short run that means we're gonna have some people who sort of look you look back and say wow that person really seems to be functioning like a parent and they're they're not they're, they're you know nobody's in court sort of assessing whether they ought to have more relationship you hope over time, you know, the law is such a blunt instrument, you hope over time you have structures um, and structures that can evolve with our changing understandings of, of what it means to be a parent um, that, that will reduce some of those issues. I would say that there, I mean, it strikes me that there are other possible intermediate rules that don't throw discretion to the judge, but they don't give the whole bundle of sticks bucket of rocks, whatever, <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to the person or people who, who, who fall into the category of parent. I mean, it does strike me that in the uh, Troxel situation, you know, we, we could have had an intermediate rule that said that anybody who has developed a, a close, substantial, long-standing relationship with the child is presumptively entitled to visitation. Um, you, you know, we did that, that uh, uh, you know, leaves less discretion for the judge, you know, obviously does run into the possibility of conflicts between the parent and, and this other person. You know, does it strike me that there are arguments that that is as much in the interest of a child if the child has had a long-standing developed relationship? Yeah, I mean, I would entertain that. Or, I mean, I, I, I take it, I kept thinking about Buffy and, and in, in Kate's ALI proposal, which you know, in many respects, I think is designed to do, you know, not to give the whole bundle of rocks to, you know, one, one I, I keep changing the metaphor, <laughs> um, um, to, to, you know, one person, but to say, well, here's an intermediate rule that that might capture what happens when a child, you know, when we've moved to thinking about a system in which a child has attachments, important attachments to more than one person, that that. Uh, eliminates some of the discretion on the part of the judge, you know, and serves the interests of children if we really do believe that, that some of the presuppositions that Bob assumes, like a, 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 a uh, child, uh, ch that, that continuity matters for kids, you know, seems like a possibility. Um, I actually, I, I, every time someone talks, I have a reaction, <laughs> and so I'm feeling like I have a lot of random uh, reactions at, at, at this point. Uh, but I, I, but just in response to what Max just said, it, it seems as though two things. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of in sympathy with with Emily's view about parental rights and how they how they they function to encourage parents to. To fulfill their responsibilities well, and what I would worry about in a um, regime in which in which adults with important relationships, you know, had some had some claim to standing to continue the relationship is is one who's going to make the judgment about the quality of the relationship, but the judge who is probably just as much not not. Uh, competent to do that as to make other judgments under uh, under the uh, uh, under the best uh, best interest standard and it's I mean I think as Justice Stevens um, sort of uh, represents it's of course relationships with important adults are important to children uh, if their parents go along with that but the cost of the cost of uh, of requiring parents to submit to their child's relationship with someone with whom they um, 
uh, with whom they don't want the child to have a relationship, I think can't be discounted in thinking about I'm thinking about this. One, uh, one. Um, I won't give my eight other reactions to every, but I did want to pick up on something you said. You said during during the talk and about children's rights, and to uh, it. It seems to me that that also, as much as in the abstract, it seems like a, a great idea that it has a problem even beyond the. Uh, uh, the addition of more claimants, and that is who interprets children's interests. Again, that if children are, are are young, then someone is going to have to to create the content of what children's interests are, and that opens the door again to to the kind kind of sort of imposition of values from external values onto the decisions. So. Well, I really agree, and I've, that's something I've written about, and I mm -hmm. really agree. I mean, it's, it's, you know, with younger children, there's always going to be some other person identifying their interests, and, you know, the other part of the comment is, for older children, they want that everybody's going to be horrified at the idea that we recognize the associational rights of teenagers to, <laughs> <laughs> to associate with. Um, yeah, I could absolutely sort of share that concern. Uh, yeah, so, uh, disclaimer first, all you know, but for for the audio, I'm not a lawyer, and I this is all mostly over my head. Um, I don't spend time reading Supreme Court cases. I'm happy to have a social scientist sitting here on my right as well. Yes. Who me? I'm just a country lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so this is really I'm finding the discussion really interesting. And one of the things I've jotted down is kind of my solution: let parents decide. First, you have to figure out who, who's a parent, and I think that's really interesting. And what Jan is saying is, I'd like that clear up front so that you don't run into problems at the at the back end. Um, but I also find myself, as you're t talking about parents' rights, it seems that the issue comes in is they bump up against state responsibilities, right? So. And I'm wondering what other state responsibilities you're concerned about. So the state has a responsibility to protect kids. And so I get the whole child protection age angle. I don't know, does the state have a responsibility to resolve disputes? It seems like they set limits on what disputes the state's willing to get involved in. What other state responsibilities are we worrying about that are bumping into? Well, I think, I, mean, I think that the, the two categories, in child protection, it's, yes, to what extent the state's interest in protecting children sort of implicates these issues. And in the private custody context, it's sort of an assumption, and it's very much what you engage in your piece, that is that, that, of course, the state has to be involved once there's disagreement. You know, like, we leave families alone, and deep, we, won't, we won't even help them when they say, we'd like you to help us work things out within a sort of an attack family, or function, you know, still functioning as a family, um, as a single family. But, uh, but if they separate, well, boy, they, you know, they need help, because if they don't have help, things are going to be worse. You know, they're, they're, we, need to, we have a dispute that we have to resolve. And that's, that is, I think, you know, strong conventional wisdom. Which, which you, you know, push against. Pretty, but, but the idea would be sort of to, to take um, sort of your observations and you sort of your, your thesis as, as a kind of friendly addition. The idea is, well, that's another kind of structural change. You could say the state getting involved creates all kinds of problems on its own. To some extent, we should have a system that's more resistant, that makes it harder to sort of get in the doors to get the state involved at all, or, or compels the state to accept the lack of dispute, uh, you know, in, in, in a broader range of contexts. It, 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 this really is an asset. It, it seems that there must be other areas of the law where the state says, no, you know, we, we can't, or maybe. The state says, says no, don't, you can't come can't, to us? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I mean, there's a sort of pretty elaborate doctrine of standing, which to some yeah. extent does that. They're, you know, you are not the kind of person we're going to recognize as having the sort of grievance mm -hmm. that allows you yeah. to come in and get our help uh, resolving it. Um, but that can be sort of a cross subject matter. It's sort of more sort of thinking about the relationship of the individual to, but sometimes it sort of gets into what kinds of controversies. Well, because it impacts families. Yeah. Well, that's right, because you start. Right, yeah. it impacts families, right? Yeah. Forget about it. So this is a pretty good segue to the next section. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's slip out to get a cup of coffee or whatever, please. Went so fast. Yeah, I have to set up PowerPoint, so it's gonna take me. Okay, so two minutes. Five minutes. Well, what he says is that 
Way, but I thought this was the original. No, no. It's always been listed this way. Okay. 